Hey, what's up, y'all? I'm Alan Hayne, the Lawn Care Nut. Welcome back to Lawns Across America. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for joining me, and I'm hoping that uh, this will be the first of many podcasts to come for this year. I'm actually doing things a little bit differently. The entire podcast, as you're hearing me right now, the entire podcast is already recorded and edited, and I'm going to provide an introduction here. I figure that's kind of nice to let you know what's kind of coming up here. And uh, what to expect. So the first segment that you're going to hear, and by the way, I shot this over several segments over a couple days. I thought maybe that'd be an easier way to do it. I'm not so sure how I feel about that yet, but yeah, we'll keep going. I'm working on it because I really like doing the podcast. Just so you guys know, it's just tough to sit down and record like two hours in a row. So I might stick with the segment thing too. We'll see if it's not too disjointed for y'all. But either way, the first segment is about John Perry's top five trends in lawn care for 2022. He did a video on YouTube and I kind of go through that a little bit and then add a little bit of commentary of my own and add a couple two trends that I think will be added. And then the next segment, I start clowning around a little bit. Sometimes I get on this mic and can't help myself. But um, at the end of that little clowning around session, I give you an app update because a lot of you're asking, how come I don't have a program in there? Which by the way, you might now. Also talk a little bit about pickleball. Kind of interesting. Not anything I know that much about, but I act like I do in that segment. And um, but really it's about a lesson that I learned playing pickleball as a kid and uh, how compet- competition turned into collaboration. So that's kind of nice. And then the rest of the podcast I talk about nitrogen. And what I do is I actually break down for you the cool season recommended nitrogen. For, from, well, I'm not saying this the right way. I take Purdue University's nitrogen recommendations for the year. How, ma- how many pounds on the ground of nitrogen does Purdue University recommend for cool season lawns? I break that down and then I compare it to my program because I'm known as the thrower down guy. I'm known as the guy that tells you to hammer the nitrogen and nitrogen drives the bus. But things are a little different when you actually break the numbers down. And then on top of that, we talk a little bit about ProVista in there. I mentioned uh, the TPIE. Tropical Plant International Expo that I attended this week. And then in the end, I actually break down nitrogen rates in my program versus St. Augustine grass recommendations from the University of Florida. So with that, I hope that you enjoy this podcast. Leave me a little bit of feedback here and there. And uh, I'll see you in the lawn. All right, y'all. Hey, uh, I don't know if you uh, maybe noticed the way I'm putting the podcast together now, if you're watching on video, but I put things in segments now and I find it's easier to get a podcast recorded that way rather than doing one in a straight two or three hours. Whenever I get an urge to talk about something or I've been pondering something or chewing on it for a while, then I'll just come in here and just record that segment. And today it's early in the morning, January 25th. I say early in the morning, it's 830, but uh, I've been here for a while setting up. But I, I was watching a video that John Perry from Green County Fertilizer, Lawncology is his uh, channel. He put out a video, Top 5 Lawn and Garden Trends for 2022. I'll link that below wherever I can. And um, I thought it was pretty interesting. I wanted to kind of continue that conversation a little bit and add two of my own to that because I've got a couple. One that I think is super fun and positive. Super fun and super positive. And another one that is negative and reminds me of some of the the really bad things I see in the fitness industry, because as you all can tell, I'm a fitness professional and, uh, you know, I'm fit to criticize over there, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Let's go to those top five lawn and garden trends that John Perry, I was going to react to the video and then I thought, no, (laughs) I'm not going to do that. That's not what I'm, I'm not a reaction channel, um, you know, where we go through and play it, but I'll just tell you what his five trends are. And you should go watch the video because he gives some really good, um, uh, color around each of these, uh, you know, looking at some, why he thinks they're a trend and, and how they're trending and, and that type of thing. So his, his top five trends, his fifth trend was battery powered equipment is, is going to be big this year. And that is very true. Um, uh, big push. I'm doing a big push on that. Um, uh, be announcing some things, some company, a new company I'll be working with on that, that front. Uh, number four, his four trend home greens. Yeah, I agree there. Uh, not for, Most people, though, I think it's going to be more like the real mowing trend where it's one of those things where a lot of people do it on YouTube. But, you know, you you go into uh, Indianapolis, Indiana on a Saturday in May and drive around for two hours. Likely you will see zero people real mowing. Um, It's just one of those things. People think I'm against real mowing. I'm not. I just it's just not me. I'm just a regular guy um, that likes to mow tall. 
And, and I, I fully admit that's probably part of my Napoleon complex, right? I grew up the shortest kid in every single picture, every single photo I have as a child. I'm always the shortest kid. I think people positioned me in places where I would look shorter than I actually was, if I'm honest with you. It's like a, it's a conspiracy theory I've been thinking about. So, yeah, I don't want to mow short. Why would I want to do that? I want to mow tall, baby. I want to be the tallest grass in the neighborhood. <laughs> so, yeah, home greens are cool. The one I would add to that, though, and, the, and this is one of my additions, is pickleball courts. And uh, I, I've seen this as a trend in Florida. And, you know, in, in so I grew up in St. Petersburg, Florida. I grew up in the center of St. Petersburg, Florida, 23rd Avenue, North 46th Street. And uh, people who are from St. Pete know that's the center of the city. That's, that's, you know, all the homes built in the 50s all look exactly the same, two bed, one bath, that kind of stuff, you know. And um, so to me, rich people were the people that lived out on the water and the the mark of the richest of the rich person wasn't a pool because everybody has a pool in Florida pretty much. Um, it was if you had a tennis court on your property or on your land. That was the rich guy. Well, today that is marked by uh, just a change in society. Now it's the pickleball court, <laughs> I think. Um, but, you know, anybody who played, uh, what was it called, smoosh ball or smash ball when you were a kid on the beach, a little wooden rackets and like this half flat um, small racquetball thing and you could play on the beach hitting them back and forth well what what you do is if you took a tennis ball but those same smush smash ball rackets and you uh, went to your backyard patio and put up a net and used a racquetball or a tennis ball you could uh, have a really small court fast-paced tennis game and it was the paddles because of the way the paddles were structured it actually slowed the game down enough you couldn't put a lot of spin on things um, that you could do it in a small area and you could really hammer on that tennis ball um, and keep it in a small area. And I believe that's a pickleball. I've actually never played pickleball. I've just seen people doing it. But it seems like that. The thing is, in Florida growing up, that's what we would do in backyards. Our patios weren't poured concrete, though, though those octagonal um, uh, patio pavers. Like, it's a thing in, in St. Pete. There, the, A lot of the public sidewalks have these octagonal um, pavers. Well, people had those in their backyards, too, as... as um, their patio, and so me and my friend Neil, we would play our version of pickleball back there, but you had all those cracks from all the the sidewalk being old and everything, so it just added an extra layer of fun or or difficulty to the the play because you might hit the ball perfect or be, or position yourself perfect, but if it hit one of those cracks, you get a, a, foul, uh, a foul bounce, and uh, it just made it a lot of fun, so I just, I don't know, kind of interesting and fun. So let me know what you guys think. Is it the home green or is it the pickleball court? Uh, I know totally a different thing overall in that the the green takes maintenance, the pickleball court necessarily doesn't, but I'm just talking about as far as a backyard sport because that relates to one of his other trends here. But his uh, number three trend was conservation. Yeah, for sure, man. We're all always trying to become more aware. I'm going to do a segment on the fact that it upsets me that us lawn people are like the 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 redheaded stepchildren like we are like like the the plant people they're they're way too cool they're you know for us they're that the cool quiet kid in the corner you know we, we can't talk to them because you know we're just lawn people and then you have the vegetable gardeners you know they're the smart kids they definitely look down on us I don't know I, I don't I don't know you know there's a trend here. I'm, I'm always the shortest kid. Now, now I, I love the plant that everyone hates. Like, it's okay to hate our plant. You notice that? Oh, conservation. Yeah. Seems like a lot of snobs in that. But, okay, number two, smart equipment um, was a trend. And for sure, and he's mentioning, like, uh, there's the Irritrol, uh controllers that Justin talked about. Those are really cool. I think that's, man, that's just a cool technology. You guys should check out Justin the Lawn Whisperer's videos on those. Um I hope I, it's not Irritrol, though, is it? It's Ira Green. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Irritrol is uh, the controllers we used at the Freedom Factory. Ira Green. All right, so much for trying to plug a friend's stuff. But Ira Green, you guys check that out. Um, and then the smart controllers. John mentions the smart controllers. You know, I have a Rachio version 2, I think, Gen 2. Um, and I've lo I love that. You know, those are the types of ways you can really start dialing those things in. Um, 
you know, conserving water, that kind of stuff. Super cool. Totally believe that. And then his number one is like making your backyard paradise. Goes back to, do you have a little sporting equipment back there? Or do you have a patio or a gazebo or a, i sorry, a gazebo? Do you maybe have a gazebo in your backyard? Um, or as I'm learning with the rare plant people, you know, there's people that pay like eight grand for one plant, these rare plant folks, people. Yeah, so I'm kind of learning about that. That's a fun trend that uh, I'm going to explore this year. So, um, yeah, so my one addition there was the pickleball. I, I do encourage you to go watch the video. It creates a great discussion. Uh, John is very good at answering comments. So his his um, comment section has really good discussion, and uh, I, can, I always appreciate that. So uh, the other thing is I want to bring out now what I think is going to become a trend, and it's a negative one, and it's this, this trend with the lawn painting. Um, you'll see that I have not touched that. The lawn paint companies have all reached out to me. I mean, trust me, uh, my project lawn at the church, Zoysia, got trampled and destroyed and went completely dormant. I would have loved to have painted it and had it looking beautiful for their Christmas services and everything, but yeah. <laughs> um, but, and by the way, that's what I think lawn painting is good for. Um, or like Pete did, where like uh, if you guys watch Pete's video on the lawn paint, I think that's the same company that was reaching out. They uh, he painted his dormant Bermuda. It looks beautiful, right? So it's a great. And then they paint the brown mulch next to it, so it looks stunning. And I think that's cool. If you're gonna paint a lawn d during dormancy to to stand out and be and be something you know cool, I think that's awesome because it's pretty obvious what you did, right? Because everyone else around you is dormant. You're this like perfect, whatever forest Kelly Green. It's obvious you painted it, right? And that's cool. That's it's it's like uh, the guy that goes the extra mile for with his Christmas lights. It's obvious he went the extra mile. I don't know. I'm, I was looking for a better analogy there, but I'm trying to say it's good in that respect. It's also good if if you're uh, painting a sports field and you're painting, you know, the mascot of, of whatever on your sports field. Obviously, you're painting lines. There's a use. There's a, a, a utility use for lawn painting. Of course, totally get that. However, I can see what's going to happen, right? Because if I own a lawn paint company, I'm thinking, well. Shoot, man, I don't just want to sell my products in the winter um, because I, I all of a sudden start trending on the Internet, and that's great, good marketing. And so a lot of DIYers are starting to make videos, and so now lawn painting can get into the DIY. I think that's really cool. But what are you going to do in the summer? Now, who's going to push this? I don't know. I'm, I'm predicting here, y'all. I'm not um, throwing shade at anybody. I, did, I know this sounds because I was just talking about lawn painting companies. I'm not throwing shade at them. I don't even know them. Um, I'm just saying what's going to happen when there is no business from the DIY market in the summer. Be now there will be obviously people painting sports fields and stuff, but I mean, you're again, we're talking about getting into the mass market. So my conspiracy theory, tinfoil hat goes, man, maybe some people are going to start doing like the fitness guys where they're on the performance enhancing drugs and they're like jacked beyond belief and they start doing TikToks where they show befores and afters and look at my transformation in 30 days. And you got this guy that's super scrawny. And then 30 days later, he's, he's, uh, you know, <laughs> silverback gorilla, <laughs> right? And they, and then they, and then what happens? Somebody makes a video calling him a fake natty, a fake natural, right? And now you have full channels that are dedicated to calling out the the fake natties or proving that someone is 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 uh is natural um <laughs> i could see this happening in in lawns now right where guys are gonna they're gonna paint their lawn all summer and they're gonna claim that it's all natural and they're gonna have instagrams and tick and they're gonna show before and after and and what it'll start at is it will be 30 day transformation right but they'll just paint to get there um, and, and, but eventually it'll get down to one week transformation, two day transformation. So that's my prediction. Now let's just, see, you know, again, I'm saying this in a fun way. I'm having fun a little bit and I'm also being a little bit serious. So let's all just have fun with it. Talk trash. Tell me what you think. I did leave a comment on, uh, John's video and I did say, this was just this morning. I said, I think the lawn painting trend will get carried away. Sure, it's fun to paint in winter dormancy, but I can already see that this is going the way of the fitness industry and PEDs. I can see all the fake natty green lawns all over Instagram claiming natural in July with zero watering. Mark it down. And then I got a, a laughing face. <laughs> John responds, you're not wrong. That was huge in the droughts in California. Lawn painters crushed it for years until people switched to gravel. I know plenty of pros that offer that service, especially when a customer is in a 
in a picky to get a lawn green for an event. I personally hate seeing paint on my shoes. And 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 I, I responded to that, uh, which I'll read in a second. But so, yeah, that goes back to there are some some reasons to paint a lawn. I remember when I worked for True Green, we did have a couple uh, times when we would paint lawns at a university that was preparing for a graduation. Um, I never had any, I never did it. I just remember that account got sold because I was a branch manager and old, old Larry, old Lairs, he sold, uh, he, he sold some lawn paint to uh, St. Xavier University. So um, over by there. And uh, so I remember that. So yeah, there's for sure that somebody preparing for a wedding or something, even though I've had several grooms that I've worked with over the years who are getting, having a spring wedding and they've asked me to help them with what can I do to get my lawn prepared for that wedding? And I've done that. And I think as a man, that's a much greater accomplishment to stand up there and go, that's my lawn. We got married on my lawn, baby, that I prepared for you. I don't know what that accent just was, but that's cool, right? John kind of did that, you know, for some friends in a video last year too. So it's all in good fun. I hope you guys take it that way, but I'll be curious to what you think about the lawn painting and mark it down that the lawn care nut has spoken. <laughs> Felt like I put a little music on for this segment. <laughs> I like this music. <laughs> it's fun. This is going to be an app update at some point. Whenever I get done playing around. I love this music, though. It'll be like, get your bro diamine at yourmastery.com. On sale right now, 5-ounce WDG covers up to 17,000 square feet. For $20.48 includes delivery. Pick up your bro diamine today at yardmastery.com. <coughs> 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 Oh, that's fun. <laughs> no, I wanted to let you guys know. Uh, speaking of bro diamine, <laughs> we, uh, the app, a lot of people are asking about the app because, as you know, there's a program that's in there that uh, populates for you. So that's going to start populating any day now. We've revamped everything, retooled it. I say we, I just, I don't actually do the work. We have an engineering team that is awesome, that does all the work. But there's going to be three programs in there now, in addition to the regular hybrid organic program, which everybody's on and most of you are going to stay on. We've also added now an all granular program, which includes granular biostimulants, which we'll be talking about throughout the season. And then we're also going to have an all liquid program, which is 100% on the Green County Next products. It uses the 1801 and the 700 as our big nitrogen pushers. So that uh, is all rolling out. So we needed to just make sure we ran that through a beta test team, which we've done. They've come out, uh, found some bugs for us. We're going to do now a small rollout. Hopefully, this is the 25th, so hopefully today or tomorrow, probably tomorrow. We're going to do a small rollout uh, to Florida and Texas, see how that goes, make sure no bugs there, and then we're going to roll it out, new programs in waves over the next week. So those of you looking in your calendar section, looking for some sort of updates, because normally you can see, you know, it's going to populate a custom program for you based on historical soil temps. It'll populate that for you now. That'll start rolling out over the next few days for all lawn types. And then you can go and toggle. Go to the old hamburger menu for butter. You could tackle it. You could figure out if you want to go on the uh, all granular or the all liquid, or you could stay where you're at with the hybrid organic. Lots of accents came through. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I got to have fun. You've seen anybody that ever gets on this mic. It's uh, addictive. You want to do all kind of crazy <laughs> accents and stuff. So, all right. Hope you enjoyed that segment. Here's another. All right. Back from our last segment. I was talking about pickleball in that uh, segment and how we used to play swoosh or smoosh ball. I don't know what I thought. I, I want to say it was called smoosh ball that we used to play on the beach. You could buy it at like Walgreens. It was in like this mesh bag and it would just be these little wooden thin rackets like in, in that ball. But somebody will help me out with the name of that. But I was talking about how we kind of developed our own pickleball in the backyard. And I talked about the uneven um, um, pavement that, or uneven um, patio that we played on and such. And, and I actually realized that over time, when we were playing our version of pickleball in the backyard or tennis or backyard tennis, we didn't actually, because of how hard it was to play on the court with all the cracks in it and stuff, we actually took it as a challenge to see how long of a rally we could have. <clears throat> and so that was more of our challenge. It wasn't about 
playing against one another like tennis, it actually became a team sport where it was so difficult um, because of the the conditions that we worked together to see how long of a rally we could get. So that was kind of an interesting little thought there. But okay, what I wanted to do next is I wanted to talk about nitrogen rates. Let me make sure I get to my notes here. Because, um, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day, hold on, I might have to edit for a sec. So I can get to my notes because I want to make sure. Okay, thanks for your patience there. <laughs> you guys didn't have to wait at all. Okay, so I wanted to talk about um, my version of throw her down or hammer the lawn hard with nitrogen because I think that in the way that I express things and the way I talk about things, I do it for a different reason than how it is sometimes portrayed by those with more experience. Let me explain what I'm talking about. So I was at the TPIE this week, which is the Tropical Plant International Expo. My friends from Bethel Farms invited me out, and um, it was great. They had a booth there. They have a really cool product that they've been uh, been working on, and it's it, well, it's out in the marketplace now and doing really well, and it's called Gotta Go Grass. <laughs> um and I'll just tell you about it because I think it's cool and it's fun. And uh, it's just, so what got to go grass is, now think about, you have to just think about how innovative this is, this idea. And, and they didn't invent the idea, by the way. They're just perfecting it. And I'll tell you why in a second. But basically, um, you think about, I used to live outside of Chicago, Illinois. And I would often go downtown and, um, you know, and, and just walk around. I just love downtown Chicago, especially when Mayor Daly was there. He used to decorate in the fall with mums beautifully all through the city. It was gorgeous. And I would go down every year um, with my family to see the mums. I just did because I just love the way they did it. And um, doing that, you'd be walking through neighborhoods and stuff. And I noticed that, you know, people living in these high rises, uh, many, many, many had dogs. And I've even done videos where I'll go through Chicago and show you all the dog, where all the dogs kill all the grass and all that as a fun thing. So I, and I always thought, man, what a pain in the rear end it must be if you are, if you're like 14 floors up or higher or whatever, and you got to bring your dog down all the time to pee and, so, you know, a lot of these newer complexes, they'll have different uh, floors where they're eco floors, where that's what's there. It's a dog park and they have places to go and got to go grass can fit into that too. But the long and the short of it is this, if you had a dog and you lived in an apartment like in Chicago, this is perfect because what you can do is got to go grass is a monthly subscription service. Actually, it's a every two week subscription service. What they send you is like a black plastic tray and um, I'll put pictures of, of it on the screen if you're on uh, YouTube. It's a black plastic plastic tray that comes with a big piece of Bermuda grass sod in it. Literally, that's grown here with soil and everything. Now, they treat it uh, so it can handle smells and so it lives a little bit longer, um, that kind of stuff. But it is literally Florida-grown sod. There's dirt there and everything inside this little tray. And, you, and, it's, and, and it's pretty large. And you could even get two of them if you had a larger dog. And you basically set that out back, and your dog can pee and poop on that. So the pee just absorbs. If it's poop, you just clean it up in a bag like you would anything else. But your pooch gets to stand on natural grass. How wonderful, right? All of, all of you rich folks with this all this disposable income that are working from home, I know you have I know I know you're there. Man, this is great, you know. <laughs> so but it's every 2 weeks. So once you get the black tray though, it's every 2 weeks you just get a refill sod. So you just throw the piece of sod away and put the new one on. That's their deal. So I was there supporting that. <laughs> the reason they were at the Tropical Plant International Expo, uh, FNGLA was there too. And, uh, you know, those are my friends that work um, alongside with um, Green Care for the Troops that we talked about. So it's really cool to see all my different partners there. But the reason that uh, Bethel was there to, to talk about that, the reason they cared about this expo is because there's a lot of independent garden centers that go there uh, and things like that. So they they had, it was, it was really good for them. But they also had... Um, you know, sod pods there, which is their, their grass plugs that we sell on our site as well. And then they had uh, different sod there. They had some Pro Vista there. And that's, that's what I talked about. And, 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 and I got to talk to a lot of people about Pro Vista at the uh, expo. And I, I'm going to talk to you all about what I learned about the tropical plants too, because that's something I've been really um, interested in. I like to learn new things and, and I'm very interested in that. And so that's another reason I went. But while I was there, I got talking to a guy who, um, and I can't remember his name, but he he's one of the scientists that worked with the folks at Scott's. And I, I'm i sorry I can't remember your name, but he he was a super smart guy. But he came over and wanted to talk to me because, obviously, I've talked a lot about ProVista. And so we're just talking about how some of our experiences with it. Um, because I have a very unique experience with ProVista in that I was one of the first homeowners to have it. But actually, to really understand what it was. Most of the homeowners that got ProVista... Um, didn't necessarily know what they actually had. Um, and so 
that's okay. It just means they can't, you can't take advantage of something that you don't know. If, if you're, if you have strengths in something and you don't know what those strengths are, you can't utilize those. Right. Um, so we were talking about that and I was saying to him, you know, the biggest mistake people make that have the, the Pro Vista St. Augustine grass, and I'm going to tell you, it's probably the same with the Kentucky bluegrass is that they don't hammer it hard enough with nitrogen. I said, I I'm telling you what happens is, and for those of you that don't, don't know anything about the, the, the Pro Vista St. Augustine grass. This is a Scott's uh, GMO product, and it's a genetically modified organism. It's wonderful. I think it's really awesome. You want to talk about cool science? This is cool science. And uh, what they did is they they modified this this grass, the St. Augustine grass, from Floratam, which is our heavily planted or most planted, you know, um, St. Augustine grass in Florida, and it's what most everybody has. They took that and they modified it by doing three things. They Number one, slowed its growth habit, so it's half the mowing, and they don't lie about that. It is uh, 100% true that they uh, only deliver half the mowing. And actually, I think it's even much less than that. I can let my backyard go when I don't fertilize it heavily and I don't hammer it with enough nitrogen. My backyard, Pro Vista, only needs to be mowed once a month. And so that is cool, right? Half the mowing. You can see why that can be a, a value add for a lot of people. Now, because of that, though, because of what I just mentioned, because people are not mowing it as much, they automatically then don't feed it as much. I, I see this. And, and, and listen, I see more homeowners that have Pro Vista in my groups, especially in our Florida group. And I, I watch the pictures of the lawns. I watch what they say about what they've done to it. When they ask questions, I ask questions about it. And I, I'm telling you, it's, it's all anecdotal, right? Okay. <laughs> but... But I can tell you, I have a unique view, and I see that that's what happens. And I also see it happening in me. So when you have a slow-growing grass, a natural growth regulator built into it, and you don't feed it enough nitrogen, it actually becomes a negative to where it will literally just kind of check out and go dormant. And it's really difficult to bring it out. When I say really difficult, um, my first year with the Freedom Factory Pro Vista, I did not give it enough nitrogen going into winter at all. And, uh, I mean, when was our first event? Was it late March? We were, I can tell you that I started hammering it with nitrogen, and I'll talk about that in a minute, maybe six weeks before the event, which for Floratam, that's way, that's a lot of time. And it actually didn't green up until literally the week of the event to, to the point where, you know, I have it all documented in video, but the long and the short of it is I was telling, by the way, the other two things by the, that make the St. August, this, the Pro Vista great are, is it's got spinach, a spinach gene into it that makes it deeper, darker blue, green color. And that is very evident too. And the third thing is that they've made it glyphosate tolerant. For those of you that live up North, you have Roundup Ready corn. This is a Roundup Ready St. Augustine. We don't say that because Roundup is so many things nowadays. It's not what it used to be. So it's glyphosate tolerant. Um, which I need to do videos about that because even nowadays you got to really look at a label because they always want to put diquat in there or something. It's diquat, but I call it diquat. They want to put diquat in there. I just like saying that that word. So those are the three things, but the biggest thing is that fertilizing, right? So I'm talking to this scientist and, I, and I'm saying to him, you know, I got to tell people to hammer it, hammer it, hammer it. And I said, think about it this way. I said, you have this St. Augustine grass that has a built-in growth regulator. Well, that means then that you can hammer it with nitrogen and you're not going to get flushes of growth. Everybody's scared of flushes of growth. I need to make a t-shirt, flushes of growth. Actually, <laughs> that was my nickname in college, flushes of growth. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> People are scared of flushes of growth. You're going to put down too much nitrogen and cause your lawn to get a disease. Like, why am I going to get it? Why am I going to do that? Because you're going to cause flushes of growth. <laughs> well, if I have this Pro Vista that has a built-in growth regulator, I can hammer it all I want, and I'm not going to have to worry about flushes of growth. So that's why I say let's teach people to do to treat the the St. Augustine, the, the Pro Vista St. Augustine, the opposite. Let's teach him to bombard it. Now, two things about that that I know. Okay, let me, let me bring you to, to reality. Let me bring you to some street medicine, okay? The first thing is that when I talk about bombarding the lawn with nitrogen, my, I'm talking about my 
programs that I teach because I can't speak for anyone else's program, but I can speak for mine. And so when I'm talking about hammering the lawn, I mean using my program. And my program seems like hammering to most people because there's a lot of steps to it, especially if you're on my original hybrid organic lawn program. You have you have uh, two different types of fertilizer that are coming, if you have a cool season lawn, six times a year. And then you have four biostimulants from the biostimulant pack, RGS, Humic 12, Microgreen, and aerate liquid aeration you have all four of those coming at you and you're doing a lot so people think that's a lot and that's good i want them to get used to throwing down because that creates experience and experience creates better quality apps and the things we're throwing down though are not that bad see my my nitrogen load on a cool season lawn is right in line with the recommendations from purdue university the reason I talk about hammering it, though, is because for some reason, we talked about trends in an earlier segment. For some reason, I don't know who did this, but over the years, everyone has thought it was so cool to try to go super low nitrogen. And I, I think that's cool too, man. I love low nitrogen. But the the average... I don't want to keep saying the average homeowner, but but folks that don't have a lot of knowledge that I'm working with that I'm that I am interested in teaching, they don't have all of the other practices. First of all, they might be coming into a lawn that has been neglected for years, number one. Number two, they might be coming into a situation where they have new construction, so they really are uh, have a don't have a leg up. What I'm saying is there's that. The second thing is they don't have all of their other ducks in a row. They're trying to get it all in line. They're, they're trying to figure out the mowing, right? And I'm telling them, well, you got to mow twice a week, right? They're like, okay, okay. And then they're trying to get their their watering in line. I'm like, well, you, okay, you need to do a tuna can test, bruh. And they got to do that, right? And, and you got to get, well, you, no, no, my God, I saw a video on diseases. I got to worry about that now. No, no, you don't. But I understand that's how that feels. And then and then now they're trying to get the fertilization. And, and so what happens is they end up doing this hot, and that, this is not a bad thing. These are the things I notice over the years that I'm like, okay, I got to figure out how can I help people to stop having this paralysis, right? What can I do to simplify things? And, you know, that's how that works. But those, those folks, um, I need to stress to them the importance of nitrogen, especially in the early days when they're starting out. And I need to, to stress the importance of them not to have fear of the nitrogen because this is the other thing. I don't know if it's because of the low nitrogen push or what, but people have fear that that nitrogen in, in higher numbers, and especially in that first number, is going to burn the lawn. I don't I don't know where that came from, but that they feel like it is. So I have to give them confidence. No, you can hammer the lawn. It's okay. It's not going to die if you hammer it. Now, what we know is, what I know, because I do the math in my product here, or I do the math in my program, I'm not actually hammering it, you see? Do you see how that works? We're not actually hammering it. It feels like you are, though. If you're brand new and you've been scared and you get out there for the first time and you're and you're out there with that spreader and you can see the fur flying around you, it feels like you're hammering it, right? This is called empathy. Put yourself in a brand new person's shoes. What are they, They're like, oh, my gosh, everything I'm throwing out here is going to burn my... That's what it feels like. I'm like, it's okay. Hammer it, buddy. You're okay. You're all right. You're going to be fine. Now, obviously, I teach everything behind that, too. Measure the furt, weigh it out the first time, calibrate your spreader. I, I mean, I make video after video, calibrate your spreader, calibrate your sprayer, right? You've done all of that. You've done all of the background work. You've weighed your furt. You've measured your area to be produced. You're okay. I promise you, you're okay. Hammer it. Now, here's what y'all know that have, and we're going to get to the nitrogen rates in a minute. <laughs> Here's what you all know that have experience. And when I say you have experience, you only have to have about one year of experience. Once you've applied something to your lawn once or twice, you're like, oh, this isn't that difficult. And then even over time, you get a perfect pattern. Like I, I fertilize my lawn pretty much the same way every time now because I know the mist, most efficient route to get around to be able to get the application out properly because that's the biggest thing, proper application. That's really the most important thing. You're already taking care of all the scientific part by just following the label on the product, right? And, and then calibrating your sprayer or spreader. That's all taken care of. Now your biggest concern or biggest challenge is to get the application down properly. And that just comes with experience. The thing we know, the secret is you can be just as good as a pro within two applications because it doesn't take that much experience. Why? Because you only have one lawn to worry about, 
right? So you can learn your land very quickly. A lawn pro managing five, six, seven hundred. I mean, in the city of Chicago, our guys would uh, manage a thousand accounts because they're all postage stamps, right? A little easier probably to do all that. Actually, no. Ask anybody that's worked in the city pulling hoses. It's actually not because everybody has a potted plant around every corner that you're going to knock over and break. But anyway, I'm rambling a lot. So let's go into nitrogen rates. So the first thing I want to talk about is in my programs, I'm just doing cool season for right now. Okay. Because what I'm basically going to illustrate to you is that even though I'm talking about hammering the nitrogen, hammering the nitrogen, what I mean is not in reality all that much. And that's what I was talking to this. I don't know if I went back to the soil scientist, but that's what I was talking about with him. We need to teach people that it's okay to hammer. We need to get them over that fear. It's okay to hammer this grass, talking especially about the, the Pro Vista, which can handle a lot more nitrogen than we're going to talk about here. Wow, this is a confusing podcast, but y'all just deal with it. <laughs> I haven't done one in a while, so I'm off my game, but sometimes the rambling is fun. Okay, so let's go into nitrogen. Now, this is cool season, and I've pulled up Purdue University. Now, this is from, I'll put it on the screen if you're on YouTube. This is I think this is a 2013 PDF, so I couldn't find anything. Yeah, August 2013, Purdue Extension. Uh, it's titled, so you could search it if you wanted to, um, Fertilizing Established Cool Season Lawns, Maximizing Turf Health with Environmentally Responsible Programs. Okay, so that's, uh, and I like Purdue. Uh, that's where I took my pesticide test at when I was licensed in Indiana, and I and so I went through the course there, and I just really enjoyed it. I liked the people that taught it, I like the way they taught it. I got a lot out of it. I learned a lot. They were interactive. They, I'm sure, I don't know if it's the same people that are still there, but I just have always respected Purdue and their their turf grass program and all that. So uh, they've always been my go to for cool season lawns. So what I want to just point out is um, when you go down on this PDF, they have a table here and they talk about total annual nitrogen. Okay, and so what they do is they break it down into um, different categories. You have your desired maintenance intensity. I like that. I wonder that, so what they're doing is they're going, what, Mr. Homeowner, what is your desired maintenance intensity? Like, what do you, how much work do you want to do? I was going to make a comment there about marriage, but I thought, no, that's probably not smart. So, <laughs> okay. So the lowest maintenance um, would be one to three pounds of nitrogen per year. Okay. Per thousand square feet. Uh, what this is going to tell you is, is that the appearance of this lawn will be a consistent seasonal green color and it, oh no, it says the appearance, it says, okay, let me start, let me start over. The lowest maintenance is one to three pounds of nitrogen per year per thousand square feet. And what that's telling you is if you do that program, that means that consistent seasonal green color is not necessary for you. So if you're putting down between one and three pounds of nitrogen, per year, per thousand square feet, it, you don't care about the color, is what they're saying. Okay. Now, I see there's a range there. I'll tell you why that's that way in a second. The second one, moderate maintenance, two to four pounds of nitrogen per year. What they're telling you here is a dense green lawn is desired, but some seasonal color changes are tolerable. Okay. I would say that's most people that have true green. They, they're moderate maintenance people as far as the desired look. A dense green lawn is desired, but some seasonal color changes are tolerable. Okay, the next, moderate maintenance plus regular supplemental irrigation. So now the next level, they're adding in some uh, necessary irrigation requirements. So your appearance, this is two to four pounds of nitrogen per year also. So this is exactly like the moderate maintenance schedule, except now you're adding in some watering, which is something the homeowner is going to have to do, right? So that add some maintenance to the program. So still two to four pounds of nitrogen a year per thousand square feet, but you're adding in that irrigation. And what they tell you here is the appearance you should expect. A dense green lawn is desired and minimal seasonal color changes are tolerable. Now, then there's the next, the highest maintenance plus regular supplemental irrigation. So if you're looking for the highest performing turf, they're saying highest maintenance. I'm going to say highest performing. And I think that's most of us. That's three to five pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year. And the appearance there would be the darkest green color and densest turf is desired. And that's us. We want the deepest, darkest blue green color we can get. So we would be between three and five pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year. Okay. 
Now, I'm going to tell you why there's ranges in a second, but what I want to do is tell you about my program now. The one where I tell people to hammer the nitrogen. Throw her down, boys. Hope for the best. Oh, that Alan Hain. He pushes people to throw down too much. It's a waste. No. I push people to get on my programs and have the confidence to throw her down and to hammer the lawn because that's how it feels. And here are the actual numbers. If you have my cool season program, um, you're going to do two applications in the spring. You're going to do two applications in the summer. And you're going to do two applications in the fall. Now, if you're super far north, I have an app that's going to do all this math for you based on soil temperatures. If you're very far north, that will be less applications. And if you're further south into transition zone, there might be a couple more. But on average, two spring, two summer, two fall. And by the way, the variances in the program for Purdue, they're, they're allowing for some of that uh, north versus south versus transition zone, such things. So with me, my first two applications are of a 2406 at three pounds per thousand. So three quarters of a pound of nitrogen. I will write this down. Two times, right? 0.75 times two in the spring is 1.5 pounds of nitrogen in the spring. In the summer, I move you over to my 7020 stress blend, and that also goes down at three pounds per thousand because the one thing I do when I develop my programs is I try to keep the spreader settings settings consistent across all bags because that adds another convenience factor. But the also the thing it does is once the homeowner is comfortable with that setting, they can switch to any of the fertilizers without really having to do any recalibration. Try to keep things consistent. See, that's all part of the program. But the 7020 goes down at three pounds per thousand. So that's 0.21 pounds of nitrogen per thousand. We're going to go ahead and just give us a home team roundup to 0.25. So it's a quarter pound of nitrogen twice, right? So that's a half a pound in the summer, 0.5 in the summer. So I got 1.5 pounds of nitrogen in the spring, and I got 0.5 pounds of nitrogen in the summer. And we're going to go back to fall, and they're going to go back to the flagship 2406, which is three quarter pounds times two. This is assuming you're not seeding, okay? And so that's 1.5. If we add all of that up, 1.5 plus 0.5 is 2, right? 2 plus 1.5 is 3.5. Oh, my gosh. Is that right? Is Alan's program only 3.5 3, 3. pounds of nitrogen per thousand? No. Let's, let's do that again. 2406, 24% times 20, 0.75, right? Point, hold on, hold on. 0.75. I really do have to do this myself. I can't believe it's so low. 1.5, yeah. 1.5 plus 0.5 plus 1.5 plus. Yeah, I had to do it on the calc. So let's go back to the old Purdue thing. <laughs> old Alan Haynes program barely makes it into the highest maintenance plus regular supplemental irrigation program. Alan, what the heck is wrong with you? Why have you been deceiving us all of these years? that we're not actually really throwing down. And also, how are we getting such great results, Alan Hain? Well, I'll tell you how. Because you're doing, number one, properly timed applications, right? Because we're working with the timing. Mm -hmm. Number two, your work, and by the way, a lot of other people follow my timing now. Everybody else that has an ebook. Number two, you're also following proper application. You are, because you're educated, you're making a proper application. That doesn't happen in a lot of the cases. People think they're putting down and they're not, right? Or they're over bombing. But you are educated. You're doing it right. And then number three, we use the biostimulants. Those actually work. And I would say all three of those are just as important. The biostimulants work. It isn't unicorn. We call it unicorn pee because it's funny. I can tell you that every lawn company down here in Florida sprays the brown water. It's a lot of it's Green County, but it's somebody else's brown water, but it works. The Humix, the Fulvix, the Sea Kelp, that stuff works. Say what you want. It's the truth. So there you go. Alan Hain is actually a low nitrogen pusher. Tell the truth. Get it out there. He's not the high nitrogen pusher that he that everybody thought flying on flying on private planes with his Cuban links. He ain't got all the nitrogen we thought he had. No, it's actually a lot less. Alan Hain is the fake natty. <laughs> All right. So now one thing you may have noticed if you're looking at that chart that I linked there, they do, uh, Purdue actually pushes their nitrogen to different times of the year. That's okay. I developed my own custom program, okay? Um, and it's okay for me to do that. And it's okay for them to do what they do. It's fine. It is what it is. I'm still lower nitrogen than them in most cases. 
Uh, but, you know, they're telling you to put down two pounds per thousand in the fall. And I don't know. There's a lot of people I've heard recently telling me that that's going to leach and destroy water systems. But apparently Purdue doesn't believe that. Unless this, you know, this again, this is 2013. I looked if there was anything newer. I couldn't find it. But I will also tell you, I didn't spend a ton of time. Um, all right. The next thing I want to tell you is why are there ranges uh, in the, you know, like three to five pounds of nitrogen per thousand? And um, the reason for that, hold on, I got to go back to my notes now real quick. So I want to go through this with you. Okay. All right. So this is from another Purdue article, but they use this a lot. And it's this, these are, these are things that don't change. So what it is, is factors that influence annual nitrogen application. So why is there a range? Well, we already talked about it. It's where you live, right? Uh, north or south. Uh, obviously, if you have a longer growing season, they'll mention that here. But there's a lot of other reasons why you might want to go on the lower end of the nitrogen or the higher end. And by the way, my 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 goal is always to start you off at my higher nitrogen, which you've just learned isn't that high. But sure, back it off over time. Why wouldn't you use less? Just spend less money. <laughs> That's just smart, right? Um, okay, so factors that influence annual nitrogen application. On the left, Age of the turf or soil. Typically, less nitrogen is needed on lawns that have been well-maintained for many years. I mentioned that earlier. You know, what, what's the state of the lawn someone's coming into? Clipping removal. Returning clippings causes an annual increase of about one pound of nitrogen per year. Therefore, it is recommended that you return clippings. That's an interesting one. I need to review the studies. John did a little study on that. And then also the guys from my soil did a study on that. I'm going to uh, soil lab. I need to go rewatch that and uh, see what they came up with. Next one would be the use of the lawn. So fertilization will need to increase if you have a higher traffic lawn because it needs to be able to um, recover. Irrigation, right? We That's kind of talked about. Irrigation increases plant growth. So if you're going to irrigate, then then that would uh, change how much nitrogen you could or couldn't uh, expect to use. For example, you're not going to apply nitrogen to a lawn that is dormant in the summer. Yeah? But if you're irrigating, you can keep the lawn from going dormant possibly, so you could keep fertilizing in my case, we're going super low. Um, species and cultivar. Tall fescue requires less nitrogen fertilization than Kentucky bluegrass. Interesting. Climactic conditions. Weather. This is, you know, if weather is not favorable for the turf grass to grow, less fertilizer will be needed. That's what I was talking about. If you live up north in North Dakota where you're covered with snow longer than down in southern Indiana, for example. Both have the same cool season lawns. Length of growing season. Yep. Soil conditions. Texture. Ooh, cation exchange capacity. Your CEC, yo, bro, you know what your CEC is? Nope, I don't know what my CEC is because I'm not one of those cool kids. Sandy soils are not as capable of holding nutrients. Use slow-release fertilizers on sandy soils, increase. So, yeah, the soil conditions can change things. And that's where we go on, or how I go on, what my lawn looks like. That's how I know when to fertilize. I just kind of know how it goes. Um, and I don't fertilize as often um, as most people. Um, okay. Site-specific turf grass growth, growth is reduced in shade, so fertilization should also be reduced. Yeah, makes sense. Diseases, some turf grass diseases are exacerbated by too little or too much nitrogen. Hmm. That's an interesting one. That's back, back to that flushes of growth. But nobody talks about the too little. I got some rust going on right now. I say, no, I need to push it. Recuperative needs. Turf grass damaged by drought stress or traffic may need additional fertilization and your budget. So there you go. There's some reasons why those different uh, nitrogen rates may flex. So that, that might just st stimulate a little discussion. It was kind of fun to talk through that. And uh, I'll do one for the warm season grass here coming up and uh, see what the nitrogen rates look like there as compared to uh, some university recommendations. All right, y'all, so now on to another segment. For those of you watching on YouTube, you're probably seeing, well, now I've changed clothes, and some of you might ask, why are you wearing these, like, frumpy sweatshirts? Well, one, because I'm fat. <laughs> but number two is it's actually cold here in Florida right now, and I only own, like, a couple of long sleeve shirts, and they're very old and stained in that. And so um, I'm trying to be going to the gym, but it's cold, so I have to wear these old frumpy long sleeve clothes to the gym, so... Yeah, that's it. Yeah, nothing special. <laughs> yeah, you, some of you might say I need to go to the gym a lot more, and you would be correct. So what I wanted to do, though, in this segment is, in the last one, um, I have already edited that and listened to it, and I hope that it was somewhat coherent. I had a uh, you know a couple tangents I went on there, 
But the long and the short of it is I, I ended up getting to what are the nitrogen rates that I recommend in my programs and how does that compare to what universities recommend, university extensions and such. And so as I've illustrated with the cool season, I'm actually uh, towards that lower end and even though my language is throw her down, throw her down, that's more about confidence to throw down and also, you know, getting people to actually take action is really what I'm more about with that. And yes, nitrogen does drive the bus. You just don't need that much when you do it at the right time. You make a proper application and also when you use biostimulants, which do help because they increase the soil health, which then also increases the efficacy of your nutrients. So all of that to say, now let's go over a warm season recommendation. What I wanted to see there is what is the nitrogen recommendation for a warm season turf? Now, I've only had time so far to find St. Augustine grass. I will, in a next podcast, I'll do all of the warm season grass types and what their recommended nitrogen is because I think this is fun. Um, at least it is for me, and it, and, it, and it teaches us something. So nitrogen driving the bus, I found the University of Florida recommendations suggested yearly maintenance schedule for St. Augustine grass. Now, again, if you're on YouTube, I'll put this up on the screen. Theirs is not quite as easy to interpret as what the Purdue University was for cool season lawns, but uh, we'll still go ahead and walk through this. And hold on, I have some coffee here. Hold on. Okay, so what I'm looking at is a chart here, and at the top it talks about fertilization recommendations, and when it talks about that, it's talking about um, basically pounds on the ground or the amount of nitrogen per thousand square feet and it tells you the months to apply that. So we're going to go over that first, and then we're going to go a little bit deeper into it because there's some other interesting stuff here that we can learn from. But what I'm basically seeing right now is fertilization recommendations. They break it apart between North Florida and South Florida. So the recommendations for nitrogen are a little different in North Florida than South, and that makes sense. We have what I have called the frost line for years. I've been talking about the frost line in Florida. Anybody that's on my Florida programs knows um, and by the way, I know I keep saying Florida. Guys, if you have St. Augustine grass in Texas, this is going to be really close to the same. It's not going to change that much. Maybe some of the months they recommend it will change, but the amounts of nitrogen aren't going to change that much. Um, but if I get enough of you asking, I'll find um, a more Texas-friendly St. Augustine grass recommendation as well. But for now, let's look at uh, what University of Florida is saying. So North Florida and South Florida are divided between each other, and they do go ahead and tell you where that dividing line is. They say at the bottom, the uh, the divider between North Florida and South Florida, the arbitrary dividing line between North and South Florida is a straight east-west line from coast to coast through Orlando, and that is essentially where I've always called the frost line as well, and uh, so it's good to see that the University of Florida is agreeing with my my uh, strategies here, my approach. <laughs> so, uh, okay. All right, so in North Florida, and then, oh, by the way, between North and South Florida, you also have two different programs you could take on. You can take on a low-maintenance program or a high-maintenance program. So let's do North Florida first. North Florida's low-maintenance program recommends a pound of uh, nitrogen per 1,000 square feet in... Uh, uh, like March, so in the spring, and then another pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet in the fall, and that's it. So North Florida, low maintenance, that's the lowest, meaning you're not looking for the high-performing turf like most of us are. You don't care about the deeper, darker blue-green color, you you, you know, that kind of thing, right? You just, just enough to keep that grass maintained and alive. That's, that's what they're looking at, that minimum acceptable amount. That is two pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year. St. Augustine, North Florida. Now, on the high-maintenance side in North Florida, they bump you, they double it to four pounds of nitrogen per 1,000 square feet per year. They are going to do that same application in the spring, but they're going to do another one in May. They're going to do another one in July and then a, a final one in the fall. Every one of those applications is one pound per 1,000 square feet, and that's going to be four pounds per 1,000 total for the year. That's the North Florida high-maintenance now, they also recommend iron in the summer, and uh, we all do that in Florida anyway. And this does not include any counties that are in the fertilizer blackout period, which it's a nitrogen and phosphorus ban or blackout. We've talked about that ad nauseum. That is not being considered here, okay? This is just what turf needs if you can do it. 
if you don't have those rules. So I just want to point that out. Okay, South Florida. Now we're on South Florida. Let's do South Florida low maintenance. They are going to do three, let's see. Yep, three applications per year. Each application is one pound per thousand, so three pounds per thousand square feet per year. That is South Florida low maintenance St. Augustine program. Three pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year. South Florida high maintenance. Those of us who really want that that high maintenance performing, high performing turf, beautiful green grass, beautiful green thick St. Augustine blades sticking up, grabbing the sun, looking beautiful. You're up to five pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year. They're going to do one in Feb, one in May, another one in July, another one in October, and then they do one in December as well. So many people tell me not to fertilize in December in Florida, but here is the University of Florida recommending that. So highest maintenance program in South Florida, five pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to review my program and my recommendations and see how they line up here with the University of Florida. Now, keep in mind, my app, just like this University of Florida PDF here, doesn't know if you're in a blackout community or 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 um, county where you're not allowed to use nitrogen or phosphorus in the summer. The app doesn't know that, and neither does this PDF, right? So we're just going with those basic St. Augustine grass recommendations, high maintenance in South Florida, which is me. I'm high maintenance in South Florida, which is also what I'm going to probably put on my new dating profile. So one of the things you want to think about then is using my app because my app lays this out for you. Now, what you can see in the app right now, it's the Yard Mastery app, and um, it actually it recommends the same program that is in my eBooks. okay? So that's just the logical progression. It's a free app. And um, what I can do is I can actually scroll through the app right now, and I can see, hold on, let me get there. I can see my calendar, and I can see my apps ahead of time throughout the whole year. Now, when it's giving me apps through the whole year, it's telling me ahead of time. It's like predicting this is what your 2022 will look like. It's using uh, historical soil temperatures to do that. And uh, that's what my whole program is based on is soil temperatures are like the bones of it. And then from there, I fit my program in between that. And so with that, I can look at what my year's projection is. Now, the yearly projection, again, it's just based on last year or uh, historical five and 10 year um, soil temperatures. That's all it is. As the year goes on, you are going, there are things that are going to make the program, you know, kind of update in real time and make it more custom. And one of those would be you. So if we tell you to do an app on May 5th, well, that doesn't mean you're going to do it exactly on May 5th, right? We're just going to show up. We're going to go, Hey, it's time to do an app. Well, you might actually do it on May 15th. Okay. Well, that's going to shuffle all your next apps, right? Um, because we don't know how that's going to go, but we do once you recorded in the journal and go, okay, I did the app on the 15th, then all the apps ahead shuffle. Does that make sense? So the, it's a dynamic program basically. And, um, that's the first thing. And then the second thing is obviously the real time soil temperature. So we have historical soil temps, but as soil temperatures change in real time, the program will update based on those. So that's why what you see in there now is just a guess based on history. Um, but we can still look and see if I got to do every app that's here um, and we don't even expect you to do every app that's there because, again, you're not going to hit it exact time. It's just we show you, hey, here's an ideal time to do it. And then whenever you get your app done, then the program just goes, all right, I'll just give you the next best dates. So that's how dynamic programs work. But I thought I would show you this because I thought it was kind of interesting. So what I did is I went into the app. I guess I, I can't really show you screenshots. I'll show you some screenshots, I guess, if you're watching on um, YouTube. But I basically went into my app and I said, okay, if I run a perfect world, I pulled up my calendar. Here's what the app is recommending from now until the end of the year. By the way, all of you that have the app, I, by the time this comes out, you may not have a program yet. We are still retooling the program. Florida and Texas, by the time this comes out, you should have a program in there. And then all the other states are going to roll out over the next week. So just wanted to say, if you're somebody that has the app and you're like in, in Maine or North Dakota and you're listening to this podcast the day or two after it's been out, you may not have a program yet. We are really literally rolling this stuff out in real time, which is why I'm just kind of talking about it in the podcast here because I've been going through looking for bugs and doing stuff like that. And I mean, the team's done a great job. You're going to love it. So, okay, let me go back to it. So 
this is what my app shows right now. And here I'm going to use my phone and, and take a little video so you can see what I'm seeing. Okay, so here is my custom program that I have. And this comes right out of my app. Again, if, if I was to run a perfect season and everything was to work out, this is how it would go. So right now it's recommending I do a 7020 stress plan. And that's because the app has just fired up for the year and my soil temps are low. They're usually not as low as what they are right now, but because they are lower, it is telling me, hey, you don't want to push too much nitrogen on your grass, which is true. So it's telling me 7020 stress blend. So that would be now. And then if I get that, if I, again, assuming I got that done today, which I won't. So in real time, this is all going to bump down. But for now, that's what I would do. And that would deliver a quarter pound of nitrogen. Then it's telling me March 1st, you're going to be due for a flagship. Again, based on historical soil temps, that would make sense. That's going to deliver three quarter pound of nitrogen. And then as we go through, it's telling me April 10th would be the next three quarter pound of nitrogens. May 30th, three quarter pounds. July 7th, three quarter pounds. September 1st, three quarter pound. And then November 1st, three quarter pounds. So total for the year, me in Southwest Florida, I'm not obviously Miami, but I'm pretty far South in Florida. Uh, it's given me one, two, three, four, five, six, seven apps for the season. So when you add all that up, what you get is 4.75 pounds of in per 1,000 square feet for the year. And the University of Florida recommends five. So we're actually good there. Now, I want to point out, and I have it written here if you're watching on YouTube, I actually have a blackout, so I don't get to do any of these summer apps, and I don't do those, okay? But for right now, they're on here because it's generic. But me, I actually do a lot less nitrogen than this because I don't apply nitrogen during the summer. And you guys see how green my lawn stays. So that's, again, accredited to the biostimulants because they actually help your nitrogen to work better. That's why the next products are called NEXT. It stands for nitrogen extension. So uh, pretty interesting there. Again, University of Florida saying five pounds of nitrogen, up to five pounds of nitrogen a year. And again, I want to stress that is for the high-performing turf. And my program, which I would consider high-performing turf, is coming in a little bit less than that at 4.75. So I thought that was kind of interesting. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed this podcast a little bit disjointed maybe a little bit different maybe not something you're used to hearing but i hope you enjoyed it either way Ooh, i shouldn't have turned the music down there <laughs> at any rate i hope you got a little smile on your face today i hope you learned a little something maybe stimulated some conversation around the water cooler or uh wherever you're happening to be listening today maybe some of you are out on the road spraying lawns already i know uh, there's a lot of professional lawn specialists that listen when they're on the road i've heard from them a few times i hope you guys are having a great day and i hope wherever you are the sun is shining on you you guys have a great week. Later.